This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. So I'm going to start off, I'm Anne, um, and Jane is going to take over uh, in a little while. Um, and I thought what I'd start off by doing is kind of explaining um, why uh, an economic historian is here talking about material culture. Um, what we're doing is uh, looking at the use of Britannia as an image and an object by the Bank of England. And our starting point, you know, our chief questions are not just what was Britannia used for, but how did the state convince people to lend money during the 18th century? Um, so throughout the 18th century, Britain is at war on a very regular basis. War is extremely costly. And in order to pay for these wars, uh, the British state not only raises taxes, but it also borrows money. And it borrows that money predominantly from ordinary citizens, very ordinary citizens sometimes. Um, this is not just merchants, but it's uh, down to the level of uh, widows, spinsters, domestic servants. We know this, but we don't know very much else about these people and why they were willing to lend to the state. The notions that economic historians, and, and to be fair, most of the economists have used to explain this, is the notion of credible commitment. The state's commitment to repay its debts was credible. Um, now, that's useful in some ways, but it still doesn't tell us enough about how that credible commitment was conveyed, what it meant, how individual, ordinary public creditors could use it, um, and in what ways they experienced it. Um, so we thought that perhaps a more useful way of thinking about the relationship between the state and its creditors was to think about it in the same way as historians have thought about relationships based on private credit. I'm thinking here about the work of Margot Finn um, and Craig Muldrew. And Margot Finn has argued that private creditors sought to read a debtor's personal worth from a variety of personal signifiers, their clothing, their social status, uh, their spending patterns. Um, and I wondered if we can do the same thing for the relationship between the state and the public creditors. Could the public creditors read the reputation and the worth of the state in any way? And, and obviously we came to the conclusion that they could, because otherwise you know, there wouldn't be a paper. Um, but they need a place to do this. And what we'd like to argue is that the Bank of England is the place where they could do this. Um, and this is partly because um, and here is the one table that we have, the rest is images, I promise. Um, but as you can see from the one table that we have, the by the mid 18th century, the majority of the state's debt is being handled at the Bank of England. The debt is also being traded at the Bank of England as well. So the, the bank is a locus for the public creditors to go and observe public credit at work. Therefore, what we'd like to argue is that the bank acted to embody public credit through its architecture, its internal structures, and through the visible actions of its clerks and the technologies that they used to manage the debt. At the pinnacle of this display, we like to suggest, stood Britannia. Dominant as an image and an object, as we will show in all of these processes. And what we like to argue is that by those means, and especially through Britannia, the bank allowed public creditors to interrogate uh, the integrity of the state's debt in the same way that they might interrogate the integrity of a potential private debtor. Moreover, the solid and stable Britannia represented a contrast to other feminine representations of credit and commerce, and therefore enforced trust and channeled the emotions of self-interest and patriotism towards an investment in a state at war. Okay. We have an image as well. <laughs> um, get rid of that chart now. Um, so 
Perhaps surprisingly, given her increasing prominence in the material culture of 18th century society, politics and commerce, aside from Virginia Hewitt's supportive entry on Britannia in the OTMB and Emma Major's um, portrayal of Madame Britannia um, and her role in linking church and nation, there has been little historical commentary upon the emergence and the use of Britannia in this period. Um, as Hewitt has outlined, Britannia was first depicted on Roman era currency and borrowed from trademark features of helmet, spear, shield, and occasionally an olive branch, which you can see in the image behind me, um, from the goddess of just war and wisdom, Minerva, who was also very linked to the Greek Athene. Um, imagery of Britannia then disappeared from popular view until the 17th century when her image appeared on a series of medals to commemorate treaties such as that of Frida in 1667 and upon copper coinage in 1670. In 1694, the newly formed Bank of England adopted her for their common seal, sitting and looking on a bank of money, which is what you can see behind me. This is um, this first representation. Although she has undergone several variations in design and accessories throughout her 300 year association with the Bank of England, ranging from a large pile of coins, a beehive, um, like the kind that you keep bees in not on her hair. Um, <laughs> something really nice. Hair, uh, lines, and a cornucopia, not to mention spears, helmets, and shields of various different styles. The bank's style of Britannia has maintained certain emotive traits. She's conveyed an elegant yet strong expression, feminine and protective. The bank's Britannia was an active, not passive Britannia, as she staked out her claim and marked her, or rather the bank's, property. Britannia also encompassed border associations with trade, industry, and profit. Arguably, she acted as one point at which the completion of the bank's aims and the goals of the British state during the long 18th century could be expressed. She also contrasted significantly with the other dominant female image of public credit, that of Lady Credit. Indeed, the point of Lady Credit is that she was intensely volatile, one moment your friend and the next turning away from you. Defoe, for example, warned that you must be very tender of her, for if you overload her, she's a coin mistress, she'll slip from you without any warning, and you'll be undone from that moment. Um, Addison was also conscious of the quick turns and changes in Credit's constitution and her tendency to fall away from the most florid complexion and wither into a skeleton. This inconstancy was applied not only to the imaginary Lady Credit, but to the very real South Sea Company in the wake of the bubbles bursting in 1720. One commentator raged, the chief managers of a certain stock may dress up their darling mistress once more and send her into the world, not without a tempting aspect, but people who have already been sufferers by their schemes will look upon her with a cautious eye. A fine lady who had deceived a man once will, for the future, be treated as a common prostitute. The con consistent feminization of the undesirable elements of credit, public finance, and the financial markets demonstrate the notion that, in the words of Pocock, the credit mechanism had endowed society with an excessively hysterical nervous system. Britannia, however, resisted the powerful and volatile emotions that governed credit. She was constant in her affections and solid at times of financial crisis. And we argue that the way Britannia was used at the bank does show an attempt at times a deliberate employment of these qualities as a means of underpinning the bank's role in the management of public credit. From the beginning, the bank was very careful about how it deployed the image of Britannia, by of nation and of commerce. She was placed upon a variety of bank-owned objects that the investing public encountered on a regular basis, which both deliberately and subconsciously constructed a particular social imaginary to borrow from Charles Taylor's work in the public mindset. In the bank's earliest days, we kind of featured prominently on account books, ledgers, and other records kept within the bank, at Garden and Bank of Money. As 18th century literature scholar Matthew Roxburgh has described, the bank was an agent that produced trust in public credit through the performance of institutional practice and rigorous documentary bookkeeping. Careful accounting, as required by the Bank of England, was a public performance to invoke trust in the bank's investors. As Roxford points out, the bank was, and still is, a tangible structure whose purpose is to produce belief in something virtual, i.e. public credit. Recording fastidious and exacting accounts, and the actions entailed in the routine of making sure the numbers tallied up through double entry bookkeeping there, were part of the performance that bank clerks presented to the public in the open tool, payball, and great ball. Um, and this is uh, from Soane's uh, recording, uh, Soane redesigned the Bank of England in the um, early 19th century. This is his recording of how it, it looked when he came to it. Um, so you can see 
that it, you know, it was a big open space in there and the public were expected to go in there and, find, and see objects on display. Um, here's another depiction as well of what it would actually look like. As Roxbury notes, the ledger was kept behind the counter where anyone who happened to encounter the innocent bank could see it. More important than the accuracy of the tellers and accountants, therefore, was the public perception of this accuracy. The placement of giant tomes in public view symbolised the practice of accounting that was done behind the scenes and described in the bank's internal protocols. The teller's appearance on these objects of commerce, therefore, performed multiple roles. She further served as a reminder of the bank's importance in the national debt, but also used her association with the nation as a means to reinforce trust in the nebulous concept of public credit, whether this was noticed by customers or not. Adding to this awareness of the bank as a performative space were various incarnations of Britannia in sculptural form throughout the different redesigns of the bank's physical space. The bank was based initially at Mercer's Hall, which is not that far from its current site on Frederick Street in the city. By the 1760s, it acquired new premises and a purpose-built building with a large sculpture of Britannia on the pay ball uh, pediment, so placed extremely prominently, in which she's pouring out coins from Cornucopia. And I've got two different, um, this is actually to two different people and two different dates because it seemed to vary wildly in the literature chapter. I'm not really sure who actually did design this. But it's definitely interesting. Britannia also featured on bank stationery. Although we expected to see letterheads featuring Britannia, these were present only for 20th century documents. Um, in the period we examined, she did appear in uh, wax seals of bank correspondence. These obviously were not intended to survive, but on rare occasions have done so, um, as seen with this example here, um, which is from 1828 on a piece of internal correspondence between the Liverpool and Fred industry offices. And but this is one, I've gone through so many um, letters, and there's only like about two, I think. So I'm going to end the painting. It's like to be painted by the end of the research as well, but letters and then just going, no, uh, but Tony appears here with what were by then many of her usual accoutrements. Uh, she's perched on a rock, she's wrapped in rose with her spear, and she has her bank of money. This Britannia also covers an olive, olive branch, um, something that our research has demonstrated became increasingly popular in other uses of Britannia in, uh, during the Regency period while Britain was at war. Um, she was also used more formally to seal documents at the authorization of the court of directors with an embossed stamp, um, a mark that was intended to be preserved, so they are slightly easier to come across, um, like the 1746 uh, Bank of England bond concerning the glass lottery. For those who have never set foot near or inside the bank, this institutional intervening of Britannia with the Bank of England was made most explicit through the design of the bank's paper instruments. So we're going back to what Anne was about saying earlier about paper. Um, Britannia appeared on the first promissory notes drafted in 1694, although these were rescinded because the director felt <coughs> liable to counterfeiting. It was a year later before notes were printed, with Britannia in the form of a common seal used to ensure the trustworthiness of genuine banknotes. In August 1695, a year after the bank was formed, the minutes of the court of directors noted that notice be given that whoever had any of their lettered notes without seal is designed to bring the said notes to the bank to change them or to have his money for them. The said court had discovered one of the said bank market notes to have been counterfeited. Um, Britannia has appeared on every printed bank note ever since. Um, and these are some of the variations um, of that. As you can see, you know, she's she hasn't changed radically. More details the technology has allowed that to happen as we go into the 19th century. Notes produced by the Bank of England did not include a representation of the monarch until the late 1950s, so Miller's was the second to actually the first monarch to appear on bank notes in Britain. Um, given the bank's origins in the immediate post glorious revolution era, the decision to feature Britannia rather than an image of the monarch may be understandable on a number of levels. It sought to distance itself from a profligate monarchy and style investments in itself as a credible commitment. More practically, in terms of economy, one never knew how long that figure might stay in power, and creating a plate was not cheap. The bank worked hard to ensure that Britannia, as a protected yet generous mother of commerce, was synonymous with the bank through its careful placement of its common seal. Although representations of Britannia elsewhere increased throughout the 18th century, for example, you can find her on the seal of the Society of Arts. She became so closely linked with the bank that images of her were subverted through satire and played upon maternal and nationalistic emotive traits as seen in this image from the London magazine in 1773. Um, I, I think that's more than all the Prime Minister sitting on her lap or something like that, but you might not be able to see it, but yes, as you can see, she's very much the mother of the there. 
The ruthlessness with which the bank was perceived to pursue suspected banknote forgers, for example, was also um, to satirise. Uh, Britannia was illustrated as a baby eater, surrounded by skeletons in the on um, Kuruchank's bank restriction note. Uh, finished with its lacing at the side to reflect the tightening of the nation's girdle and the signature not of bank cashiers but of um, 17th century hangman Jack Ketch, who was notorious in his terrible aim and his acts. Uh, this subverted image highlights the extent to which the bank portrayed Britannia as the ideal of protection and generosity to her subjects. So on the um, images I showed just two slides ago, there's you know some nice foliage and things like that around uh, kind of the Coco style. Um, and here we've got skeletons, basically, and the discarded babies. Um, 20 years previously, the bank's perceived vulnerability was illustrated through um, uh, the portrayal of Britannia as a fragile elderly lady who, far from standing fast and protecting her nation with her shield and spear, was in need of protection herself from the unwelcome overtures of the government. The old lady threatening the middle street in danger illustrates the old lady, which is now an established nickname for the bank. Uh, she's a ghastly in horror, with none of her usual accompanying arsenal of shield or spear. This Britannia fell far more easily into the tropes of passive helpless femininity rather than the bank's own representation. These satirical images serve to complicate our ideas about representations of Britannia and the bank, especially during times of crisis. Yet, they do nonetheless reinforce the argument that Britannia provided one means for individuals to understand, observe, and scrutinise the performance of public credit. Thought of in this way, Gilbert's old lady thread the industry is a message to public creditors that increased scrutiny was warranted, and a message to Pitt's government that its actions put the integrity of the national debt at risk. In conclusion, in this paper, we have shown how the Bank of England acted as a locus at which it was possible to observe public credit at work. We have also shown that Britannia was a dominant image and object of the bank, and have argued that she provided the bank with a persona that was in stark contrast to other feminine representations of credit and commerce. In doing so, she provided stability amongst the emotional upheaval that could accompany activity in the world of finance. But Britannia was an emotional image and object of the bank in other ways as well. Investment was not, and is still, remains not um, a rational choice. It requires the relinquishing of control to another agency. Emotions of anxiety and even fear are bound up in that choice and Britannia acted to quiet them. The emotion of hope is also bound up in investment. Indeed, all investors hope for a return on their capital. By linking the bank's emotions of trade, industry and profit to the financial stability of the state, Britannia justified the hopes of investors.